Our text this morning is uh, from the gospel reading in Mark 9. The verse that I would draw to your attention is, uh, well, most of verse 7. It says, a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is our text. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was um, watching something the other day. Actually, it was it was a, a movie that didn't matter very much. It was a good movie, but it didn't matter. But there, there were uh, some guys on the Galapagos Islands, and they were very interested in the wildlife there, because people are, because it's, it's actually kind of weird there. Uh, but uh, the thing that I noticed is that there, there are so many things in nature that are not always as they seem. In fact, they, they actually try very hard to look like something else. Uh, for instance, this is these guys, they found a moth that just looks like tree bark and disappears unless you're really looking for it. I imagine you've seen stuff like that in nature shows. They, they had uh, uh, shown uh, an insect who uh, was in a thorn bush and, and the thing looked exactly like a thorn and it was sitting there on the branch. Uh, and right next to that, there was a, a what do they call it, a, a, a stick bug. You know, they, uh, they, they look like a twig that's sitting on a tree and you can't tell at all unless they move. Uh, they, they found a butterfly that looks exactly like, or very nearly like a different butterfly so that it could look like the poison one even though it isn't. Uh, you know, nature is full of stuff like that. Uh, what I would say is, and you'll see this in the, the things that come to us uh, this day, is that our imperfect understanding is pretty easy to distract and to make us think one thing when something else is going on. Now, if you look carefully at the circumstances uh, on this high mountain, we don't know what mountain it is, it, they never tell you what mountain it is, and nobody seems to know. Uh, you, you might get uh, somewhat distracted like that, thinking you're seeing one thing and missing the point. Uh, Peter did, certainly. Uh, what he's looking at apparently is um, full of mistaken concerns. The, the, the ghost of Elijah and Moses were there appearing, uh, talking to Jesus. Uh, and, and of course, to, to a Jewish guy, uh, a first century Hebrew speaking dude like Peter is, uh, this would be uh, a, an impressive experience on its own. It's Moses and Elijah, they're there in uh, some kind of ghostly spiritual form, apparently alive in some sense, but they're there. Those guys are really important to him. Uh, and of course, Jesus is there too. The thing that you can't, well, I mean, this is the problem with words sometimes. Uh, you, you, you can imagine the scene, but I, I, what I want you to see is what Peter is apparently missing. Uh, Moses and Elijah are there, uh, alive somehow in spirit, and Jesus is there in the flesh. I mean, this is the Son of God. He's in the flesh, and he's blazing with divine glory. And I, I would suspect that it would be kind of difficult even to see the other two guys. But for some reason, Peter stands there and um, he, he sees them, like, I, don't, I, I don't want to say like equals, but it's, he talks to them like that. Here are the heroes of the faith of the Old Testament that is all of the scripture that he really knows because that's all there really was at the time. And, and they're all alive and they're there with him. On the other hand, if you'd look closely, you'd probably have trouble seeing Elijah and Moses at all. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, this is what happens when uh, you see things, uh, you know, like a piece of paper on a desk and you turn on a spotlight, you might lose the piece of paper on the desk, even though it's nice and white. Uh, it's not the same as blazing glory. But, uh, you know, here they are. Uh, and Moses and Elijah are kind of important. I, I think we would all agree that this is so, they are important guys. Uh, this is the, uh, the pair of outstanding symbols of the old covenant with God. That's what Moses is. He's the one that brought 
the tablets down the mountain for the people of God to, uh, to become the people of God and, and to have God as their God. I mean, this, he's sort of important. He's the one that rescued them out of Egypt and the whole bit. And, and of course, Elijah stands for all of the prophets. And, and uh, uh, on top of that, he's the one that uh, Malachi says is going to show up to introduce the Christ. Uh, and of course, later we find Jesus talking about John the Baptist as the spirit of Elijah, but it's still Elijah is the one they're waiting for. And, and uh, so there's Moses and Elijah in all of their grand importance to the circumstances. Are you really supposed to pay attention to the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament prophecies? Of course you are. All right, so should you attend to all three of them? Of course. But... But do you see Jesus? Because that's what those two guys were looking at. They weren't talking to each other. They were talking to Jesus. Should he stay up there with the other two uh, side by side? Uh, nearly equals to, I mean, uh, you know, you might picture the possibility of three guys sitting in tents up there on the mountain. Uh, you know, what, as Peter suggests, maybe they ought to do. If you could go, uh, if you needed something in this world, you could go up like, uh, you know, sort of like the Oracle of Delphi and walk up the mountain. And if you needed to know something in the way of wisdom, you could ask Moses questions. Or if you needed to know something about the future for your own planning or whatever, you could talk to Elijah about prophecy. If you needed power because you're hungry or sick, you could talk to Jesus. That would be kind of awesome. Uh, then there's the part about Peter being terrified. And, and it also says that he had no idea how to respond to what he was seeing. So he comes up with this three tent thing. Uh, but you have to understand, he has no idea what he's talking about. And, 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 and this is a terribly important. Now, see, here we are, sitting in this place, looking at this thing through the eyes of Peter and James and John, uh, and, and having some confusion, because it doesn't seem to be Peter, James, and John that have any idea what they're doing. It's true that Moses and Elijah are important, but why are they important? It's because they point to Jesus coming. Because they don't know that he's going to be Jesus, but they're on the mountain. They know who he is. He's the son of the living God, standing there in the flesh, in divine glory and power. And, and, and they're talking to him because, uh, it doesn't say it here, but in the, the Luke version of this, uh, Luke is reminded that they're standing there talking about the exodus of Jesus, uh, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Uh, exodus is kind of an important buzzword for us all, right? We know what that is. That's the people of God coming out of Egypt at Moses' hand, no less, coming out of Egypt to be free from their slavery. And God chose them to be there in the promised land with him. Jesus is doing something like that again. His exodus is the one where you and me come out of our slavery to sin and death, uh, which is about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah are pointing to that. They want you to see Jesus for that. But not only that, they want you to see who he is. Because, you know, as we sit here, there's three guys up in the mountain. You can't see them. But Jesus is in blazing glory. He's in divine, amazing, stunning divinity standing there. We know who he is. Those guys who were looking at him, they could have had no doubt who this is. Here is Jesus, who is the son of the living God, in flesh, on this mountain, about to walk down the mountain and go to Jerusalem to die. God did that. Moses and Elijah pointed to that in their whole time on earth. That was their, almost their primary function as they did all those other things, pointing the way. They were not staying up there on that mountain. Moses and Elijah probably had better things to do anyway because they, these are heavenly guys and they've, they've already uh, begun to experience the paradise of living with God. But, but there is Jesus. 
And there are the appointed ones who were there to bear witness to his full and true identity, his presence in this world. And when they were able finally, because Jesus told them, don't talk about this yet. Uh, uh, when they were able to speak, they were speaking of his purpose and his fulfillment at the empty tomb. As the father spoke openly on this day, very much like he did at Christ's baptism, uh, in that particular case, he said, you are my son. In this particular case, he's speaking to the three guys that are there with them saying, this is my son. Right here. Here he is. This one. This is my son. He's going to die. Listen to him. Listen to him. As God talks, you're supposed to listen, right? I mean, that's, I think, a rule. And when it was possible to see what that was mattered, there, there was no one there with them because there was this cloud and then the voice and then the cloud goes away and there's Jesus looking kind of normal. Matthew says he approached them and touched them because they're laying on their faces like dead guys because they're terrified. And, and here Jesus comes to them, the son of God, son of the living father, the one in heaven, the, in the flesh, he stands there, he comes in his normal sort of way, and he touches them in compassion and he lifts them up so they can go down the mountain together. But there's no one there with them but Jesus. Understanding and wisdom that had come with Moses or with anybody, uh, uh, if they don't point to Jesus, they're pointless because they're, they have nothing to do with your salvation. Uh, if there is uh, some plan and uh, thinking about what lies in the future, all of that is uh, important, I guess, enough for, for all of us to do. But if it doesn't point to Jesus, it has nothing to do with your salvation. Jesus alone is the one who suffered and died to forgive you. Jesus alone is your salvation at the cross. There's no one else. Jesus alone defeated death when he rose in fulfillment of all that was discussed here from the dead. Jesus alone is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you all the time. Moses and Elijah, they are the law and they are the prophets, they are wisdom and they are the future, yes, but they themselves direct you to Jesus alone. You need to listen to him. There is only one way to the Father. It's only one way to the heaven. He is the way. There is only one full truth of your salvation. He is the truth. There is only one life in you that is eternal. And Jesus is that life. Now I find it... Uh, fascinating really that there is this discussion of tense some uh of the other people that have uh d translated this they talk about booths because they connect it to the uh the feast of booths that uh, the jews have to observe uh which um well i, I mean what's a booth <laughs> it, it's a, a temporary little shelter for them and they're all supposed to sit in these little booths and and the whole point of it is to remind them of the exodus of coming out of Egypt and being freed from their bondage and, and becoming uh, one with their God as his people and on their way finally to the promised land. So here are tents. They're all over the Bible. Uh, uh, Paul's profession was making tents. And there's this tabernacle in the desert where, where the Ark of the Covenant and all of their worship took place, the sacrifices, the whole bit. That was all in a tent. The tabernacle is a tent. And in fact, the word translated as tabernacle is tent. I don't know why. Somebody liked a little more formal term, I guess. Uh, then there's all of the, I mean, you know, can you imagine if you're 40 years out there in the wilderness, what are you sleeping in? More than likely, you're in a tent. There's, you know, there's nothing out there to make a house out of, and you can't travel with the thing. So, you know, you're probably living in a tent, and they did that. So what's the point of all this tent stuff? It's, it's a temporary living space. 
And, and, and it's there until your true home comes forth. Now, normally we think of the, you know, Jesus saying, I'm, I'm preparing a place for you, which, of course, he means. But when you get to places that are in Scripture that describe where you're heading, you find that Jesus is your promised land. He is your paradise. He is your salvation. He is your eternal heavenly living place. He is the fulfillment of everything. Everything that Moses did, everything that Elijah said, everything that the Old Testament points to is Jesus, the fulfillment, the son of the living God in the flesh, in this world to die and to rise and to ascend and to send your Holy Spirit to, to, to bring you home, which he is. Everything else is temporary. Everything else is a pointer. Everything else is designed only to point to the salvation that Jesus is. He is your salvation. He is the point. He is uh, in a tent, so to speak, in this world until he brings you home. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.